Hello, awesome students, and welcome to Protein Chemistry Day 4. Um, we're going to talk about some of the coolest stuff today, so hopefully you enjoy it. First up, we're going to talk about the many ways that proteins can break down. Firstly, we want to talk about the most common way that proteins are broken down in your body, and that would be hydrolysis. This is one of the organic reactions that we learned earlier in this chapter. So in hydrolysis, remember, that's going to actually break bonds. So which of structure would that affect? Remember the choices are primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Right, that's the primary structure, right? Because it's the backbone and you're actually breaking it apart. It's covalent bonds that are holding it together and that's what we're breaking in a hydrolysis reaction. This process occurs in your stomach because you're basically digesting proteins, right? This is whenever you eat meat or eggs or nuts. You're breaking down the protein for use by your body. You actually break it into the um, amino acids and then your body stores those and saves them and will use them again to make its own enzymes and proteins that it needs to run. Not only is protein used to build muscle, but it also is used to make all the enzymes in your body which catalyze hundreds of reactions. So that's why it's so important that there's enough protein in your diet. Outside of your body, the most common way to break down proteins is denaturing. This happens a lot and you may have seen it before and not even realized. When you denature a protein, it actually only affects the tertiary and quaternary structures of the protein. But this is a problem because they need those things to maintain biological activity. That means to work in the body that they're in. So without that, they basically just flop around and they're not good anymore. They can't be put back together. So for most types of interactions, tertiary interactions, um, no bonds are actually broken. These are all intermolecular forces. There is an exception, of course, of the disulfides. So before we go on to talk about some examples of denaturing proteins, um, I want to mention how do you know if a protein is being denatured? So the most common way that you'll see is that things will stop being soluble. So generally proteins are water soluble. Um, they usually have a hydrophilic layer around the outside, but um, when they denature, then they're not. So that's the most common way that you'll see. So this is, for example, it could cause a precipitate, meaning a solid that comes out of solution, like when milk spoils. This could also be um, just it becoming opaque, like if a solution was clear, but then all of a sudden it looks like a milky or creamy color. It's because the, there's a liquid that's coming out of solution that's not quite solid. So if you see anything like that, you know that there might be some denaturing happening. I'm going to make sure that you know the six causes of denaturation. That just means ways of denaturing. You also want to know basically the causes of them, the forces that are disrupted, and be able to recognize examples. So I'm going to give you some examples first. One way that you can denature a protein is by using heat. This is commonly what happens in cooking. So lots of foods have a chemical change when you cook them. We mentioned that in chapter one. But the reason that is is often because the proteins are being denatured by the heat. Another way, number two, is going to be um, by changing the pH. So that could be by adding acids or bases. A classic example of this is when milk curdles. So you may have seen this before. Usually it's not something you want. Um, there's two ways that this could happen. One way is you could actually make it curdle on purpose. So you could either add bacteria um, to make yogurt or cheese. You can add lemon juice or some sort of acid that way to make it curdle also. Um, the other way is if you just leave milk out, it'll actually start to grow bacteria and those unwanted bacteria, the harmful ones, will start to change the pH and they'll actually cause the milk to curdle. So definitely don't drink it if it came from that process, but the other processes are perfectly fine. The third way that you can denature a proton is by adding some sort of reducing agent. Um, this is actually done intentionally whenever you get either a perm or when you have your hair chemically straightened. So how many people um, get perms these days? Probably not as many. A long time ago, back in the 80s, people used to get them all the time. It was a very distinctive look, so you should probably Google perm from the 80s. It's pretty fun. So these are doing a chemical reaction with your hair that changes the disulfide bonds. For number four, we have detergents. That's the same as soap, so we'll just put that in parentheses here. Um, so this is going to work a lot like soap does, and but it's going to affect your proteins in different ways, so we'll talk about that. The fifth way that we know how to denature a protein is by adding heavy metals. So this could be, for example, lead, mercury, 
things like that. Um, these are ways that you can get poisoned. You don't want these things, right? They're very bad. So the reason that they're so bad is because they will poison and denature your proteins um, that you need to live. And this is a big problem, especially if it happens in your blood or something like that. The last way that you can denature a protein is just mechanical agitation. This means like shaking it up or um, mixing it really quickly. It's actually physically beating it around. So this is what happens when you whip cream with either a whisk or a mixer. You can also do this um, when you make meringue with egg whites. So these are two ways that you can do that. So based on what we just mentioned, let's see if we can look at these pictures and tell what kind of denaturation we're, we're getting. So pause the video and try to do that. Is this what you got? So for A, that's milk curdled, you can tell because it's got those chunks in it, which is disgusting. Um, but so that must be acid base. Remember we said if you change the pH, that's what causes milk to curdle. For B, what happened to those eggs? Obviously they've been hard boiled, right? So that's gonna involve heat. So then that's what happened to the proteins in the eggs. They've, they've changed color as we said. So um, the milk is becoming a solid that's forming a precipitate. The eggs have become a solid from a liquid and also see how opaque they are. They're not see-through anymore where that clear part would have been see-through. Now it's white. That's another sign that the protein has denatured. For number three, it's kind of hard to show this, but this is the perm, right? So if you look on the left, that's sort of the effect of the perm. If you look on the right, that's the, the girl getting the perm. As you can see, she's got the um, curlers in her hair. She's got a very um, chemical solution on her. And her, look at her nose. So that's the way you know it's a perm. It's the stinkiest thing that you will ever experience. Because of how it works, it makes thiols. And thiols are kind of the smell of a skunk. So um, imagine you're just putting like skunk smell on your head. It does go away. It washes out much easier. So that's a good sign. But during, it's very, very stinky. If you're interested in learning more about the chemical process that occurs whenever you get a perm or whenever you chemically straighten your hair, um, then you can look at this side at the bottom. You can get it from your notes. Like you can cut the link from the notes that are posted. So you can hear more about that. So now that we've had a little introduction into denaturing proteins, let's go into more detail about each of the different ways that this can occur. So I've used the same numbers that we got from that table that came from the textbook. So that's why the number order is a little bit switched around, um, but I wanted to match the examples that we had seen. So first of all, let's talk about heat and agitation. These are really similar because they're both just adding some energy that's used to break some kind of weak forces. So what are the weakest forces that we have? Right, those are usually dispersion, right? So although they can be higher if you have more surface area, they're still generally pretty weak. The amino acids that rely heavily on dispersion forces are the nonpolar interactions. So those are gonna be affected by heat and agitation. Also, the hydrogen bonding will be affected because those are weaker forces than some of the other ones. So we already kind of know how heat works to break up intermolecular forces. Um, we saw this with boiling point and we saw this with melting point. It's just adding energy and the energy to move it around is so much that it won't stay together. It overcomes the energy that was being used to hold it together. Agitation is the same kind of thing. It's just the energy is actually you or the um, device moving something around really quickly. So it's kinetic energy. That's the only difference. The next two methods of denaturing proteins should also be somewhat familiar. So we're going to talk about acid base first. Acid base or changing pH um, is actually going to affect the side chains on the peptide by changing anything that's ionized to make it be unionized, which is the same as saying neutral. So something goes from having ion ion forces to being basically hydrogen bonding or something like that. So it's a much weaker force. So what tertiary interactions would be affected by this? The most obvious one would be the salt bridges because basically if you have to have an acid and a base and one of those isn't an ion anymore, then that whole attraction, the whole thing of being like a salt is gone. So those are ruined. It also will affect hydrogen bonds because the hydrogen can protonate things that have lone pairs and then the lone pairs are covered up and they can't really do their job. So that's how that works. So when we add a detergent to proteins, this changes the solubility of some of the interactions. So this actually works like soap on dirt. Remember that soap uses the hydrophobic tails to dissolve into the nonpolar part of the dirt. Well, proteins also have a nonpolar part as well. 
as we've discussed, that's one of the possible interactions. Usually that's on the inside of the protein, so like this little red pocket here. And then on the outer side of the protein, there's these purple parts, which are usually hydrophilic because it's going to be soluble in water, either within the cell or within the blood. So the soap gets inside there, and then whenever it gets into there, it takes the hydrophilic part, and then the hydrophilic part's on the inside where it's not supposed to be, which causes the pocket to open up, and the whole thing becomes soluble in water. This is actually not a good thing because then it completely unwinds, and then it doesn't work as the protein anymore. So the only interaction that's affected by the detergent are the nonpolar interactions, which are also known as hydrophobic interactions. So I've saved these two ways last because they're a little bit less familiar. So we're going to talk about reducing agents and heavy metals. As you may recall, when we talked about reducing agents, anything that's a reducing agent is going to add hydrogens or decrease oxygens. We actually don't do anything with the oxygens for this protein. Um, it's going to be a specific reaction which is going to change the number of hydrogens on a sulfur compound. So it looks like this. So as you can see, this reaction is taking this disulfide bond here and then breaking it apart on this other side by adding hydrogens and separating it into thiols. So where there was a covalent bond holding the two things together, now they're separated and so the whole protein can unravel yet again. So from this example, it makes it obvious that the tertiary interaction that's affected by this would have to be a disulfide bond. That's the only one that can undergo this kind of type of reaction. The last type of denaturing we're going to talk about is heavy metals. These can actually um, change two different types of interactions. So first, if you look down here, it says these heavy metals here that I've listed can react with sulfur. So those would obviously affect disulfide bonds. When they do that, they're actually going to um, reduce the sulfur the same way that a reducing agent would. So that's the first thing that can happen. This actually has several interesting applications. The first is that you can actually use these heavy metals to kill bacteria. Because they also have proteins, this will cause their proteins to denature and it will hurt the bacteria. Another thing that this allows us to think about is that what happens if you get poisoned with one of these heavy metals? Well, because it reacts with proteins, you could actually just ingest some protein um, and then it would react on the protein in your stomach instead of in your body. The other thing that can happen with heavy metals is that these ions have charges. So because these ions are charged, that means they can actually interfere with acidic and basic interactions. So um, instead of having the protonated amine to balance with the carboxylic acid with the negative charge, instead you have this metal. When that metal gets in the way, then that means that the protonated amine can then float away, and then again the protein can open up and come apart. So that's all we have to say about denaturing proteins. But you definitely want to check out the activity on Blackboard. That's all we have for today's video lectures. I hope you enjoyed this topic. I always think it's really interesting and to see the chemical perspective, it's a really great example. So hopefully you found it interesting too. Have a great day.